Darkcast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. In January of 1982, in the small town of Seaside, California, five-year-old Annie Sang D. Pham was on her way to school, only a few blocks from her home near the Fort Ord Army base. She would never be seen alive again. Her body would be found two days later, tossed on the side of the road. The hunt for her killer would go cold for the next 40 years, currently with no end in sight. Today on California True Crime, the murder of Annie Pham, the Seaside Angel. Welcome to another episode of California True Crime. This week, uh, I get to be your host. I'm Charles. With me here is Jessica. Sean couldn't be with us this episode, but he will return uh, on our next one. Uh, I am uh, really excited about this case. Uh, it's an important case that we found. Uh, actually, you found, Jess, if you want to talk about how you, how you really came across this one. I just came across it while researching another case in the area, and this was a cold case. It involved... A child, as you're going to tell everybody, and I had never heard of it before, and we're always looking for cases that we can get more attention on and kind of spread the news about, and this seemed perfect for that, but there was very little information on it when I first looked into it. Before we begin, we do want to issue a warning. This case deals with the kidnapping and murder and sexual assault of a five-year-old. This might be an episode that you might not want to listen to with small children present. And as, as Jessica said, this actually came from a research she had did. One of the things that really stuck out to me when you first started talking about this case was the fact that there was very, like you said, Jessica, very little information. Aside from the warning, there are a few other things that uh, we want to address right from the start. This is an active case, and as such, there's precious little information circulating as Annie Pham's killer is still at large. The majority of the information for this episode uh, comes from really only a couple of articles that were circulated from the Monterey Herald that have been reprinted and circulated by a few other news agencies, as well as some news reports and articles that have circulated since the case has been reopened in the last year and a half or so after remaining cold for 40 years. As with all of our information, you can find a complete works cited page uh, on our website, californiatruecrime.com. Even with this little information in the public sphere, this was a case that we thought was one that needed to be shared. This is a case of a five-year-old girl who was kidnapped in broad daylight, sexually assaulted and murdered, then dumped in a field like trash. Her case is not well reported in the news. It was all but forgotten until cold case detectives and seaside investigators went back over the case to work on finding justice for the victim and trying to bring some type of closure to the family. We wanted to help in some small way to help spread the word about this case and help raise awareness about Annie in the hopes that someone somewhere might know something and be able to help investigators shed more light on this case. We also wanted to do what we can to report on the brief life of Annie Pham and the type of person she was and the love that she and her family shared. Now, this was also kind of a, a special episode for us because we actually were able to talk to uh, acting chief of police of Seaside, California, Chief Nick Borges. This was kind of a, a big honor for us. We've it's really kind of California True Crimes, one of our very first interviews. Um, chief Borges has been with the police department for 19 years. He served in various positions, including detective and SWAT commander. Chief Borges has been with the police department for 19 years and has served in various positions, including detective and SWAT commander. Chief Borges actually also graduated from the FBI National Academy during session 277. We want to thank him right from the start uh, for taking the time out of his busy schedule and talking with us and sharing what he could about the case. He was really upfront and said he could not share anything uh, about the actual investigation other than what we um, had researched and kind of confirmed some of the things that we talked about. He really did talk about the procedure, which I thought was pretty fascinating, and, and some of the reasons that this case had remained cold for so long. 
So again, thank you. Uh, if you're listening to this, uh, Chief Borges, we thank you very much. This is an active investigation, and if you know something or have any information, please contact the authorities and help this family bring some closure to this 40-year-old tragedy. We will state it throughout the episode as well as on our socials at Cali True Crime, as well as on our website, CaliforniaTrueCrime.com. The numbers where anyone can contact authorities with any information that can help lead to the arrest of Annie Pham's murder or murderers. So the story of Annie Pham and her family really starts in Vietnam in 1975 with the fall of Saigon. To put things in perspective of, of what her family kind of experienced and what was going on in the world uh, in 82, you kind of have to go back a few years, to, like I said, to the fall of Saigon uh, in 1975. Now, after growing unrest and hostility at home in the U.S. for the war, and this was helped along by the leaked Pentagon Papers, which revealed that American government's secret escalation of the war since 1945, America was leaving Vietnam. Now, Annie's father, Trung, was uh, in the South Vietnamese Army. He had fought alongside the Americans. But by the end of 1973, the American military had pulled the majority of its troops and personnel from Vietnam. In January of 1973, America had signed a treaty with North Vietnam. This treaty would end open hostilities between the U.S. and North Vietnam. However, this would not end the war. The North and South Vietnamese were still at war with one another. This would rage for the next two years, and without America's involvement, the North Vietnamese dominated the war. On April 30th of 1975, the North Vietnamese army would crush the last resistance from the southern Vietnamese forces and would take the capital, Saigon, which at this time was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Saigon had managed to remain relatively safe during the rest of the war. That was no longer the case and came under direct attack. Many feared that what would happen when the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, would take over. The last time they had held even a portion of the city for any length of time had resulted in massive arrests, imprisonments, execution, and mass graves. Most Americans that were still in country, as well as those citizens of other countries that were allied with the U.S., wanted to get out of the country as soon as possible. Add to this, those in the South Vietnamese government or those that had either worked for the U.S. military or in some capacity had supported the war effort for either the South or the Americans were all looking to get out. The evacuation began and the flights out of the country were packed with those trying to flee. This seems really common to things that we've seen over the last year, seeing now with refugees from other nations, including in the Middle East, in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, where we had troops and then we leave and then people are you know, who helped us quite desperately trying to get out of the country. It is. And I think what really shocking shocked me too was looking at the, the photos that came from the mass evacuation in the last days from Afghanistan and the major airports and seeing those put next side by side with those photographs that were taken in Saigon in 75. They're almost identical. People with with nothing to their name, whatever they could carry on their backs, crammed into every nook and cranny of military aircraft, civilian aircraft, helicopters, planes, whatever, just to get out of the country. And that's that's the first wave. Now, there's also an issue of what to do with the dependence of Americans that were living in Saigon. And that means that it that means family members of American troops that had married uh, Vietnamese citizens and they had families, they had dependents. So it's not just we're taking soldiers out. We're taking we're tr- trying to get not only all of those people that helped us, but also all the people that just for humanitarian reasons are trying to get out of the country. Eventually, the defense attache office began to illegally fly them out of the country and help them get to Clark Air Force Base in Philippines. I thought this was really this this showed the level of commitment that the Americans had to to helping people in need that even though governments all over the world were still arguing about what to do, the the people on the ground said that's not that's not right. We need to get these people out. And the closest place was the Philippines. By the end of the evacuation, even amongst all of the false starts, and accidents, unpreparedness, 
over 120,000 people were evacuated from Vietnam. 7,000 of them were evacuated from Saigon by helicopters. And I think that's what some people, if, you, if you've studied this or you're familiar with this, if you're listening to this and you live through this, you know that those are the pictures that we all remember seeing on the news. However, that 120,000 only makes up for a fraction of the over 800,000 plus Vietnamese that fled the country after the war. Those that were not able to get out on one of the flights were relegated to getting out of the country by any other means that was possible. And for most of those people, that was by boat. This situation was where the fam family found themselves in 1975. Desperate to find a way out of their home country before the invading NVA took control, the fam and hundreds of thousands of refugees from Vietnam taking to these boats in order to escape and 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 boat is kind of a generous term these are ships of all kinds fishing vessels trawlers tugboats like if it if it floated they were on it packed to the gills eventually these people would be called boat people it would be a name that would be kind of cycled throughout on media it would be uh it's what other countries would call them but this term especially in places like california um, and other countries that took a lot of these refugees would become sort of a racial slur for a, a long time uh, associated with these vietnamese immigrants now these refugees gathered whatever they could uh, and their families packed themselves on boats of all shapes and sizes. The, the problem was most of these vessels were never meant to, for the open ocean. Most, uh, again, a huge part, population, uh, part of the population in Vietnam at this time, especially around the coast, were fishermen. But they were coastal fishermen around like the deltas and the rivers. However, because the, the thought of getting captured by the North Vietnamese was so terrible, they packed on these small private fishing vessels and then set sail for the open ocean. Again, like we said, these were never built to cross the Pacific Ocean. These people made their way on anything they could get so long as it was away from the approaching North Vietnamese army. These people were looking for a place that was safe, away from the horrors of war and the terrors that had consumed their country in the past, and were willing to do anything and brave any danger to get there. Pirates preying on small boats, terrible weather, starvation, dehydration, not to mention being turned away from every safe harbor uh, in other countries if they made the journey long enough to get there. It's estimated that between 200,000 and 400,000 died in the attempt between their home country and a safe port. Those that were luckiest were able to get to a port that would accept them or better yet, be met by allied ships that were able to rescue them uh, and bring them safely to shore. At this point, I do want to mention that on our website, we'll, we'll link, there is an um, amazing story of a Scottish ship that details one of these rescues and what an impact one boat of survivors, them saving one, this one group of people, how that rippled out. So uh, I urge you to check out our website uh, on the Annie Fam page and, and read this account. And this is the story of the Fam family, who would eventually number 10. They would set out with nothing more than what they could carry in their arms and boarded a 60-foot boat along with 200 other people and left their home country that had been torn apart by war, fleeing the possibility of imprisonment, torture, and death for the chance at a better life somewhere, anywhere else. Remember that Trung Pham, Annie's father, had been in the South Vietnamese army and knew that he would be able to he would not be able to live in his home country if he stayed. And it turned out they were one of the lucky ones. A US Coast Guard vessel had met their boat off the coast and helped them make it to safely to shore. There's no reports of what they had to endure on their journey, but the stories that survive from this time all paint the same picture one of terror, hardship, sadness, with a slim idea of hope at the end. The Pham family had made it when so many others hadn't. They made it to California and were helped to settle in the Bay Area for a time, trying to adjust to their new world. Their family would also grow once they arrived in California. Annie Sang T. Pham would be born here in the United States, almost as if her birth would signal that things would be different for the now 12 members of the Pham family in their new home. California was not necessarily the peaceful home that the Pham's were looking for at the time. As you can imagine, once the refugees settled in California, as well as other parts of the U.S., they experienced racism, 
bigotry and violence. This was a newer version of the same anti-Asian sentiment that was popular at the turn of the century with the Chinese Exclusion Act and the Alien Land Act. For more on this, if you're interested in kind of the history of those, you could go back and listen to our, our past episode in, from season one where we talked about the rise and fall of Fong Little Pete Ching. We did kind of a deep dive on his life uh, and how uh, what was going on in California specifically at that time. But I know, speaking for myself, in the 80s, it, w- it felt like it was the same thing, except in this case, instead of being focused at the, on the Chinese, it was focused on, on the Vietnamese immigrants or Vietnamese at refugees. The Pham family, however, would eventually move to Seaside, California, uh, which is in Monterey County. It was here that Trung and Nu Liu Pham, uh, Annie's mom, along with their 10 children, would live for the next four years. Trung would be able to take up his pre-war career as a fisherman, and the family would become a part of the community. Annie would eventually enter public school at Highland Elementary, just three short blocks from her home. I know we've done a lot of history so far in this episode, but I think it's important that we kind of get some of the background of of the places again, and and that's kind of what we do on California True Crime. We like to go in and and really kind of go into the places. So before we get into too much of the crime, we want to talk a little bit about Seaside in general. Uh, Seaside was founded by Dr. John Roberts, who had left New York in 1887 and had bought up 160 acres. He actually sold it as uh, vacation lots. So even at the turn of the century, um, the Bay Area uh, had a land mogul that was making money off of rich people wanting to live there. It would open its first post office in 1891, but not officially be incorporated into a town until 1954. It basically had always been kind of a tourist destination right from the start. It was actually about a mile away from the Hotel Del Monte, which I had never heard of until we started kind of researching this area. You might be familiar with the canned food, Del Monte Vegetables. It actually comes from this name. The Hotel Del Monte was one of the most luxurious hotels in the entire country. It was built by Charles Crocker, who was one of the big four railroad barons here in California. If you don't know about the Hotel Del Monte, you may know some of the stuff that was built around it. Pebble Beach Golf Course was actually originally on the hotel land, as well as 17 Mile Drive, which is kind of a scenic drive around the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, if you're ever in there, it's a, it's a beautiful drive, but that was actually part of the driveway into the hotel at the time. Uh, I also found it was interesting that the the term Del Monte became kind of a shorthand for luxurious things. Um, Del Monte brand foods was actually started in Oakland, California, and the proprietor named it Del Monte because of the hotel. It has no connection to the hotel. It just it sound it's a ritzy sounding name, so we're going to name our our product after it. Over the time, though, the obviously the 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 town gets incorporated. Uh, the hotel will eventually close, but what stays is the land, and this area is also home to Fort Ord. This is a retired military base, and the military base in 1910, President Theodore Roosevelt decided to locate a new U.S. Army base in Seaside, and this would become known as Fort Ord. It would house roughly 20,000 infantry members and civilian workers. It would serve as a training facility for infantry as well as artillery and would also house the U.S. Army Veterinary Hospital that was dedicated to caring for artillery war horses and mules. At the height, this entire complex is about 2,000 acres, so this is a massive area. It eventually would be decommissioned in 1994 and would be repurposed into government offices and NGO offices as well as an extensive nature preserve. So this becomes, an, an, again, I guess it, it goes from a luxurious place where rich people go to vacation. You know, um, the hotel eventually closes. The military base gets huge and is the center of activity. And then in the 90s, the military base, base closes, and, it's, and it kind of goes back to being a vacation resort spot. So for our purposes, especially during the time period that Annie Pham lived there and her family lived there, Fort Ord was still open? Yeah, Fort Ord is going, in in, in the early 80s, it still is, it's going gangbusters. There's still a, a, a full complement. It is still uh, an active training place for infantry and artillery. Um, by this point, obviously, the veterinary uh, hospital had been closed, but it still housed a few museums and things like that. So it's a very active place. And it is... Fort Ord, for our purposes during the 1980s, Fort Ord is one of the major employers of the time. So people are fishing, people are, 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 are working in 
I guess, the hospitality industry, the service industry, and then there's the military. Now, Seaside is kind of an interesting place. You know, when you start looking into Seaside, Seaside is is really kind of a study in dichotomies. On one hand, it's very opulent. It's very, you know, it comes from this, you know, like we said, this vacation place. There's a lot of money in there. But on the other hand, it does boast lower than the national average on family incomes. So it does seem to be a, a place that is split between the haves and the have-nots. In the 1980s, Seaside also kind of has an area, the, as an area, has a reputation for as the crime capital of Monterey. It's seen as a place that was rife with drugs and violent crime. In fact, this is all just kind of part of a myth that arose during that time period. We've seen the same thing happens in other places around our state that get a bad rap because of how the outside world views them. Uh, Stockton in Northern California is a perfect example of that. Usually when things are reported about Stockton, it's tied up with a violent crime. The truth was that crime statistics that were, were high during the 1980s in general, but they weren't any higher than any other part of Monterey Peninsula. This was due to the fact to economic pressures that everyone was feeling as well as new crack epidemic, epidemic that was hitting the nation. This was something that was especially true for communities that were part of the lower socioeconomic spectrum, of which Seaside at this time was. Del Monte Manor, named after the famous Del Monte Hotel, was the largest housing project for the poor in Monterey County, and it was located directly in Seaside. The reality of the situation was that the residents and community leaders of Seaside were trying to work together with police and city government through a grassroots campaign to reduce crime, and it worked. By the end of the 1990s, crime was on the decline, felony arrests rose 29%, and things were changing for the better. However, Seaside would still carry with it this stigma from the past for some time. It's also important to remember that Seaside was growing a lot faster than its larger neighbors. In the period between the end of the 1970s and the mid-80s, Monterey would grow around 3,000 people. In the same same time frame, Seaside would increase population by 10,000 people. In fact, between 1982 and 1985, Seaside would grow by 8,000 people alone. This increase in population will see a rise in crime, but since the stigma was already there, it was reported more while nearby, nearby Monterey, with an increase in building and tourism, would see their same rise in crime covered almost uh, in an entirely different light or not, not at all. And again, we see that in a lot of other communities, the lens being focused on there for, for various reasons. So the total population of Seaside, is it roughly about the same size as Monterey? Yeah, just about. I think Seaside's population right now is around 34,000 people. I think Monterey is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 people. Uh, What I also found interesting, too, with not only is that Seaside is about the same population, if not a little bigger than Monterey, it's also boasts one of the most diverse population due to its proximity to Fort Ord. It includes a thriving Vietnamese community, again, like we had talked about with the fall of Saigon and so many Vietnamese coming into California. California becomes one of the largest Vietnamese communities outside of Vietnam in the entire world, specifically along uh, coastal regions in in California. Many of these, uh, like the family, like we said, are resettled there after the war and continue to live there. This community was not like a lot of other places it had its problems, but the people that lived there were working together to make their home a better place. As I said, be- the people that live there, like a lot of communities, they don't like the way it's portrayed outside. So a lot of the community leaders were working with the government, and they really are tackling these issues head on. This is where we find the Fam family. On Thursday morning, January 21st, 1982, Annie Fam is getting ready for kindergarten. It was a cold morning, around 45 degrees, but it was not a long walk from her home on Sonoma Avenue to Highland Elementary School, also located on Sonoma Avenue. It would only be a few blocks to school, and Annie was used to it. Her older brother, Keith Van Pham, told reporters later that their mother had walked Annie to school every day at the start of the school year. But at one point, Annie had told her mother, quote, stay home, mom. I can walk by myself, unquote. And she did with no issues. I think initially this is going to be, this might be different for people to listen to is that she's 
a five-year-old kindergartner walking to school. I know initially that kind of struck me as odd, but when we were talking about it, you and I and Sean, you had a different perspective on it a little bit. Yes. I lived in a very similar situation. I lived just a little bit away from my elementary school, so I definitely walked. My siblings walked to school in the 80s. I know we talked to Sean, who lived a little farther from school. He said that he walked. So to me, this is a pretty normal thing, even though she's little, to have done. And if you could talk a little bit about the the neighborhood. I mean, she's very close to the school, right? It's not that far yeah, away. Her, her house actually is on the same street that the Highland Elementary is. It's It really is maybe two blocks at a stretch from her front door to the front door of the elementary school. If you stood on, at the gate into her front yard and looked down the street, you'd be able to see the um, the elementary school. She lives in a, a, a smaller neighborhood. It's primarily uh, Vietnamese. Uh, it is a lower socioeconomic uh, area, but from what Chief Borges was able to tell us, it was um, a, a pretty open community. People knew one another. It was, a, you know, there was a lot of activity. It wasn't like, you know, Annie's walking down a deserted street. So, again, this, this kind of raises the question of somebody seeing something at the time and why it's important that if, if you're listening to this and you find any, you know, if, if something rings a bell or you saw something strange, please contact the Seaside Police because as we go through this, you know, any information can possibly lead to, to uh, an arrest. Now, Annie is described as the type of person that was always cared about the people around her. She was a child that was always looking to help out and take some of the burden off her parents. And you can imagine that she wanted to walk to school to allow her mom more time to help the others in the family and take care of all the things that running a big household would entail. Since it was close to their home, in fact, you could almost stand on the sidewalk, like I said, and watch her walk down the street. Uh, her father at this point in, in the mornings, he leaves very early. He's a fisherman, so he has to go out with the tide. So he's gone. So he leaves the mom to kind of wrangle the rest of the family in and sending the kids off to school. So that morning, Annie walks to school by herself. That afternoon, when she did not return home, the family began to worry. It'd be at 8.50 p.m. that night that they would eventually contact the police, possibly after searching the immediate area and contacting friends and neighbors in the area. This is unconfirmed. This is just kind of a guess on our part. We know that the Fam family, the English was not uh, not their first language, obviously. Some of the younger and uh, kids were fluent English speakers. So I can imagine that if their child didn't return from school, their first response would be, let's check the neighborhood. Did she go to a friend's house? Did she stop by the store? Did, did she stay late at school? Whatever. They report her missing at 8.50 to the police. Do you happen to know if she made it to school? No, she did not make it to school. Chief Borges did talk to us about the idea that after this is happening and when investigators finally get involved and they're interviewing teachers and students, they do talk to two of her friends in her class. She has kind of two kind of close friends. I talked to her teacher. She did not make it to school that day. So she goes missing during that short walk from her home, most likely during that short walk from her home to the school. She leaves her house approximately around 10, 1030. So the two-block walk for a five-year-old to Highland Elementary, somehow she goes missing in that. Hi there, I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And together, we are the husband and wife team behind And Then They Were Gone, a true crime podcast about unsolved missing persons cases. Each week, we take a deep dive into a case that I have researched and written about and that you have never heard of. Right. And I react naturally and usually leave you with a whole lot of stuff to add it out of the podcast. Very true. But I do love getting your analysis and a fresh perspective on these crimes that I've been spending so much time learning about. So you can see us on your favorite podcast app, every Wednesday when we release a brand new episode. And find us on the socials at ATTWGpod. And you can also visit us on our website, and then they were gone.com. Could you hold the key to bringing someone home?
An on-duty officer would go and take the statement of the family after the report was made at 8.50. The report was minimal, and it wouldn't go into too much detail. In fact, it was only about a paragraph long, and it was really unclear what other steps the police took at that moment. And this was, again, this is some some of the reasons why we're talking about this case is because this case goes uh, cold for 40 years. This is kind of that first nail in that that path of going cold. In fact, it would take two more days for detectives to even get involved. By then, the body of five-year-old Annie Pham would be found murdered and thrown out by the side of the road less than 45 minutes from her front door. Now, at the time of Annie's disappearance, Fort Ord was a thriving military base with all the personnel and activity that would go along with that type of military facility and would be one of the largest employers in the area during the 1980s. It was here that Annie would eventually be found by U.S. military criminal investigators. She was found in the brush of a firing range not more than 100 yards from South Boundary Road. We'll have a map on our website. They were following up on a tip they had received about some marijuana growers that had been spotted near the firing range. The exact place was not disclosed, but we do know from our interview with Chief Borges that Annie was found less than a quarter mile on South Boundary Road. So we, so again in our map, you'll see this uh, South Boundary Road kind of um, is a long, semi-deserted road that connects two other main thoroughfares around Fort Ord. This area is covered by scrub brush, and from the road would ex- would obscure a body, especially that of a small child. This means that her body was disposed of somewhere around 38-minute drive from the place where she was kidnapped. The military investigators would assist the seaside police and Monterey County sheriffs in investigating the crime, but would come up with no definitive evidence pointing to who could have done this to Annie. Also, since her body was found on government property, the FBI was called in, but like the seaside police and military investigators, there was no movement on this case. There was evidence collected and cataloged, but there has not been anything shared in reports to the public or statements made to the press that detail what this evidence was or could have been. In fact, Acting Chief Borges will say that they do have a lot of evidence, but he didn't share what that was or which direction that pointed. And again, I think that's important because it, you know, it is an act of investigation and We'll kind of go into his his beliefs about this case uh, as, as we talk, but everyone is very, very tight lip. We did contact the district attorney, district attorney's office for Monterey County for a comment. Uh, their response back was they weren't going to comment that we needed to contact the Seaside Police Department, uh, and they had, they had the full backing of the DA's office. So everybody's kind of focused on this investigation, and now... And with the idea that they're, that, you know, they're working through what they cataloged 40 years ago. It's just the question of, like, why wasn't anything done 40 years ago? Eventually, the autopsy would show that Annie had died of strangulation, but not before being sexually assaulted. But if more evidence was collected, it would not be reported to the media or shared by police. DNA isn't its infancy, but there have been many cases where evidence was collected at the time, and it's used many years later to help point to someone that could have been the culprit. Investigators are hoping that this might be the case here 40 years later. It's strange to me that we had said, and we've said this a few times already, but it remains to be said that this case does not have the wide circulations that others that we've covered had This is the height of the stranger danger scare that we talked about earlier of the 1980s. We've talked about the Stainer case and how every year the family would be interviewed by the papers, the television stations to get updates on the case. And this case happens around the same time. There's almost no coverage of it outside the area and certainly not in the years since. I know we've covered several unsolved cases now and specifically ones that haven't gotten as much coverage as others. And we've asked ourselves you know, we're always surprised as to why we've even covered another one with a child involved. And in that case, it did seem as if the family didn't have as much access to the press because of a, a, a hearing issue, you know, that maybe the press didn't know how to necessarily talk with that person. So maybe that's an issue here. I know the, the family being able to constantly talk to the press is, seems to be one of the big reasons why a story will stay 
in the newspaper. You know, if you're if you're able to afford to put up a billboard, if you're able to every year make sure you're doing um, candlelight vigils, things mm-hmm. like that, where the press has another plot point sounds terrible, but another point for them to be able to write about. They want another part of the story. Yeah. And when you have a family or other families out there who don't have that same access to the press or the press may not be interested because maybe racism or other issues going on or maybe other cases come up that they just find more interesting or people want to hear about. I, I, it just, I don't know. We can't quite get the whole, there's so many cases that just aren't covered. No. And I think, I think that's, unfortunately, this is another case of that is that we're not going to ever really understand why it wasn't covered in the media. I mean, you know, the only mention I could find in our newspaper archive is a notice about a local insurance agent's collecting to start a trust fund to help with a funeral expense. This doesn't mean that it wasn't more covered. It just could be that those issues weren't digitized. It could be that the story was dropped off everybody's radar soon after she was found uh, or after her body was found. But it, does go to speak to like some questions about why certain cases aren't covered more. And I think it, it, it needs to make us ask more questions about how reporting is done of victims, how families are contacted, and then the help given to those families to make sure that, that justice is done in those cases. Unfortunately, this is where the case lies. For 40 years, a five-year-old raped and murdered and no one is to answer for the crime. It would remain a cold and forgotten case by most of the general public until it was announced in February of 2022 that the DA would be reopening the case and be working on it with the Seaside Police Department. When asked about this case and how it could have gone cold for so long, one of the things that Acting Chief Borges said in our interview was that this case was simply forgotten. It was, like so many other cold cases from the 80s, mismanaged even in how it was stored. He said that when he came on board to his current position, he made it his mission to make sure that that oversight of these cases being mismanaged and uh, misfiled and really forgotten would be corrected. Annie's case was in a box, kind of forgotten, and 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 this is this is the term that Chief Borges used: a junk drawer, forgotten for forty years. It was not until a couple of years ago that Chief Borges had found the file and started to kind of go through it. Like I said, his main purpose, and he really spoke with a lot of passion about this, was to make sure that these files and these cases that have gone cold, that haven't had the work done on them that should be, are taken and looked at again and made sure that every possible avenue is expanded and run down to make sure that that everything is done possible to seek justice for these victims. This is where I think, and we've talked about this before, how maddening it is that there aren't, that like this idea of people working on older cases. I mean, because we've covered so many cases mm-hmm. where police had to move on to the next thing that was happening. Right. Um, and then cases were put on a shelf for whatever reason. And it just seems like something we should all be able to agree that we should be paying for. Right. And I think this is another example of that. And to talk to, to Chief Borges about, It was humbling to see that amount, like, and he spoke with passion and fervor about, like, this, we're going to solve this case. I mean, he says this, I think he said that about every five minutes of our our hour and a half discussion of, we're going to solve this case. I know it. I know we're going to solve this case, whether from the evidence that we found or or through somebody's tip, we're going to solve this. It's solvable. We just have to do the work. He speaks of that about all of these missing, these, these forgotten cases, these cold cases, that they need to be organized. They need to be looked at again. But as you said, a lot of times police departments aren't, don't have the facilities. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the money. So having any resources put towards this, you know, and again, we're going to, as we talk about this, as this unfolds, Monterey Peninsula was, was pretty uh, lucky in this respect. And this is where we we get introduced to, to uh, Bill Clark. Now, Bill Clark is a retired police officer that had been working as part of a larger group of investigators and retired police officers that solely work on, on cold cases. And again, I am going to quote Chief Borges because this is amazing that we got to talk to him. But in his own words, he describes Bill Clark as, quote unquote, Superman. Like that was his words. Bill Clark is Superman. What he did was he actually reached out to the chief and said, are there any cases that we can work on that you would like like us to work on? And Chief Ward just said, yes, I have one right here. 
and handed Annie Pham's case to him. Uh, for the last two years, Bill Clark has been working tirelessly on this case, uh, recreating uh, interviews, going back over evidence that was collected, basically doing everything that a cold case detective is supposed to do. Clark and his group were given all the help from the Seaside Police Department would give, including a space uh, at the police department. Basically kind of gave him the keys and said, you're welcome to work here anytime. And then, like I said, that was two years ago. Chief Borges has said that Mr. Clark and the group have reexamined every piece of evidence and filed it in a lot, filled in a lot of the gaps that were left from the inv- original investigation, bringing this case all the more closer to being able to close and actually get a, 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 a murderer arrested. The Monterey County District Attorney's Office Cold Case Task Force is considered to be uh, the largest and most comprehensive to identify, review, investigate, and prosecute unsolved homicide cases. It has been awarded a grant of $535,000. This is really mainly used for the testing of evidence which had been collected at the time, i.e. DNA. They have been selected to focus their efforts on those cases where evidence can be tested for DNA and can possibly point to a perpetrator of the crime. This effort also uh, works in the same way to help give names to unidentified victims. I think of the case that you covered, Jessica, of Jane Doe 40 last year, uh, where we still don't, we know the, we know the murderer, we know the place, we know all everything except for the victim's name. So this is an instance in, in Monterey uh, Peninsula where this cold case group would also do that. This task force includes seasoned homicide investigators and dedicated prosecutors with substantial cold case experience. They've created a proprietary database to identify and categorize and examine unsolved cold cases throughout the county. The task force, according to their mission statement, will select 15 cases per year where either DNA, where either suspect DNA has been identified or there is DNA evidence that can be help identify a previously, like we said, unidentified. So that's that's from their website's like mission statement. Like in the Golden State Killer case or the murder of Janet Skullcop, the task force will utilize familiar DNA searching and genetic genealogy through proprietary accredited private laboratories when it becomes necessary. Then the information will eventually be entered into either VICAP or NamUs databases. This organization is a combined effort between the county's police, sheriff, and DA's office. All the information is shared between the agencies with the sole goal of bringing justice for the victims' families and to let them know that these crimes have not been forgotten. Bill Clark's been working on this for two years in in, in partnership with Seaside Police and, and Chief Borges. So where does that leave us with the Annie Pham murder? Well, in February, like I said earlier, February of 20. 22, the NFM case was reopened and a press conference was held by Deputy DA Matthew Luru, who helped the cold case task force but did not release the reason for the re- reopening of the case. He was asked about DNA in an interview with a media outlet, and his res- response was, quote, DNA is something we look for any in any case, unquote. Since the mission of the task force is centered on the idea of testing DNA evidence, it's a good bet that there has been some new development in this area. However, not much is being shared through the news agencies or media, and this again is due to the fact that, um, according to law enforcement agents, to make sure that any case that's brought will not be tainted in any way if it goes to court. Both of Annie's parents have since passed away in the years following her murder, but her siblings were notified about the reopening of her case. Her older brother, Kiev, who was 10 years old at the time of Annie's murder, has blamed himself since that day 40 years ago. He's always felt that he should have protected his sister and walked her to school. Chief Borges had said law enforcement had let him and his family down, but they were working as hard as they can to make up for that and bring Annie's killer to justice. Neither the DA or acting Seaside Police Chief Nicholas Borges would comment on a suspect due to, it again, it being an open case. Borges would say in an interview with Monterey Herald, quote, this is one of the most disturbing cold cases we've had, unquote. He continues, quote, going through all of our files, it's clear that this is a monster individual. And while I can't get into specifics, there is a lot of evidence, and I am hopeful we can bring justice for this beautiful little angel, unquote. 
Borges has said that he's optimistic about bringing Annie's killer to justice. As I said, he is he he talks about this being a case that is solvable that will be arrested. He goes on, quote, we have quite a bit of evidence that have that has existed at the onset of this case. I want to solve every cold case we have. There is nothing more rewarding than giving the family a sense of justice by being able to tell them, here's the person who killed your loved ones, unquote. Uh, the chief did tell me, um, in fact, it was, it was kind of ironic. It was only a couple of days or maybe a week before, uh, our interview with him that he had actually had a huge picture of Annie fam made. So it's a, it's a poster size picture and we'll have the picture on our, on our, um, website of Annie that's sitting in his office. And as people walk by, everyone is interested. Like, have you made an arrest? Like, why do you have the picture? And he simply tells them. This is the picture I'm going to use at the press conference when we announce that we have caught him. And like I said, I've said it quite a bit today, but I'll, I'll say it again. He talks about this with certainty, that it's, it is a certainty, not a chance. He calls any fam, quote, the seaside angel. The picture shows a five-year-old ready for the world, a loving daughter, sister, and friend that her brother describes as somebody who is shy and sensitive but always caring about others and wanting to help her family in any way that she was able. When we talked with Chief Borges, he said that somebody knows something. They know or knew someone that might have been acting strange. He told us, quote, You might not remember the exact day or what might have happened, but you might have a memory of someone that was hanging around and made you feel uncomfortable. Call the seaside police. Let them know no matter how small, could be the one piece of information that leads to the arrest and helps to bring this person to justice. He said that this is a case that will be solved, but it needs people to step up and share what they know, no matter how small. The Seaside Police are looking for anyone that might have something to share about the abduction and murder of Annie Pham. If you know something, no matter what it is or how small a detail, You never know if it could be the missing piece of the puzzle that they're looking for. Please contact any of these law enforcement officials. Sergeant Matthew Doza, Seaside Police Department, 831-899-6751. Acting Chief Nicholas Borges at Seaside Police Department, 831-899-6892. Matthew LaRue, Monterey County DA's Office, 831 755 Five two six seven, or if you'd rather remain anonymous, you can notify the anonymous tip line at eight three one eight nine nine six two eight two. Jessica has our cold case for this episode. On Sunday, August fifth, nineteen eighty four, Timothy Weiner made a report to police that his fiance Diane Fox was missing. Wiener had last seen Diane Fox at their home on the 600 block of Airport Road in Monterey, California, at approximately 2 a.m. that morning. According to him, Diane had left the home in a borrowed car to go to a nearby 7-Eleven on the corner of Ramona Avenue and North Fremont Street and never returned home. When Wiener found the car she had used two blocks away from the home, he notified police. When police investigated, they found the car was empty except for grocery bags and a 7-Eleven bag. When they spoke to workers at 7-Eleven, they confirmed that Diane Fox had been in the store around 2 a.m. earlier that day. On Tuesday, August 7, 1984, two sheriff's investigators were in the area of Lapis Road when they found the deceased body of Diane Fox. Her body was near the Southern Pacific Railroad track and about 100 yards from the entrance of Lone Star Industries in Marina, California. She was only wearing a light blue blouse, and she had stab wounds as well as wounds from a struggle. Investigators believe she was dumped in this area after being murdered at another location. They also believe she was killed just shortly after she went missing. At the time of her death, Diane Fox was 24 years old, the mother of two children and a hairdresser. She was due to be married the following weekend. Her fiancé and the man who reported her missing has been named as a person of interest by police. No arrests have been made, and DNA examination of the evidence is ongoing. If you have any information about Diane Fox, 
please contact investigators at the Investigative Division at 831-646-3814. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime on the DarkCast Network. For a full list of sources, as well as more information on the case, head over to our webpage at californiatruecrime.com, where you can support the show by joining our Patreon, which has the option of ad-free episodes. Our web store is up and running with some new California True Crime merchandise, such as t-shirts, mugs, and special episode-exclusive stickers. If you'd like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. Make sure that you subscribe to our show to get our latest episodes. Leave us a five-star review or tell a friend to get the word out about California True Crime. We'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at Snail Ranch Studios and The Hangar. This has been a production of JCS Inc.